the Hong Kong pro-democracy protests continue. After months of debate and weeks of often heated demonstrations, the island is still divided over the best way to elect its next chief executive. In the second part of a special behind-the-scenes report, we look at how the activists' campaign attracted rising criticism from the pro-Beijing camp and how direct action led to a showdown with the authorities. In June this year, pro-democracy activists from a group known as Occupy Central with Love and Peace organized Hong Kong's first unofficial referendum. They asked voters to choose a method for nominating candidates for their leader, the chief executive. Some 800,000 people participated in the poll. More than 700,000 bank proposals for public nominations, something the Chinese leadership wasn't likely to approve. But they didn't, and Occupy Central vowed to make good on a threat to stage a mass sit-in in Hong Kong's business district. But no one anticipated what was to follow. By early October, Hong Kong had witnessed a massive and spontaneous show of civil disobedience. The city is now grappling with an unprecedented political crisis, with no end in sight. Protect a central district and kill all the traitors. When we caught up with Professor Chan Kin Man, one of Occupy Central's founders, towards the end of July, he had just received a death threat. Something to curse you with vile language, you know, <laughs> with F letter words and, you know, from time to time we receive letters of this kind. There were also other things for him to worry about. Pro-Beijing groups had recently launched a signature campaign against Occupy Central. We have been experienced violent threat of this kind, but the, um, the signature campaign opposing, you know, Occupy Central movement, saying that we are violent, we are promoting violence, I think it's totally unfair. Organised by a group called the Alliance for Peace and Democracy, the signature campaign was just the first phase of a larger exercise targeting Occupy Central. And on the first day alone, we have almost got 200,000 signatures already. This is a record for Hong Kong. Nobody else has come near to a figure like that. The group drew flack for allowing foreigners and tourists to sign the statement. But Chow said anyone was welcome to support their cause. We do not have a specific political package to present to the public. All we say basically is that let Beijing talk to the legislative councillors, let them talk, let them negotiate, let them come up with a form of political reform that Hong Kong people will agree to. But don't threaten Hong Kong, don't drag us into Occupy Central. August, Chao's alliance called a protest march. Beijing was due to release its proposal for electoral reform two weeks later. Before the protest, local media had reported that organizers were paying people to attend, a claim the alliance rejected. I think their reports show that um, the, the level of journalism is really, really declining in Hong Kong. It's a sad fact. But this secret video, shot on the day of the march by a Hong Kong journalist, appears to support the allegations. Yeah. 
咩三百八啊？咁你俾唔俾？咩嘢？啊，講一句你俾唔俾？我做。誒，哇！三百八。係點啊？好，唔該曬啊，唔該曬。We tried to interview some of the protesters. Can you please don't bother me? I'm too tired. Please. Many either refused to talk to us or said they couldn't speak the local language. Up on a bridge, two young men waved the colonial flag. The two attempted to leave, but were met by an even angrier crowd. An uninvolved bystander found himself caught between the two sides. As the crowd below grew more agitated, police intervened and they were finally able to leave. On the last day of August, student leaders and activists from Occupy Central gathered at the Legislative Council to listen to an announcement from Beijing. From 2017, but the proposal was nowhere near what they had hoped for. Under the plan, Hong Kongers would get to vote for their chief executive in 2017. But candidates for the job must be approved by at least half of a nominating committee stacked with pro-Beijing loyalists. That same night, some 5,000 Occupy Central supporters gathered at a park next to government headquarters. Yeah, 
the students were out again the following day. Chinese official Li Fei was in town conducting a seminar on the proposed election plan for Hong Kong. The students knew that the city's pro-Beijing politicians and lawmakers would be attending. They had a few questions for them. Not every protester, though, was unhappy with Beijing's decision. One floor down, the lecture was underway. Student leader Alex Chow was in the audience. Chow didn't get to do much more. He was quickly shown the door. In September, Occupy Central started preparing to make good on their threat. Ahead of the big event, the group held a series of smaller protests. They shaved their heads as a symbol of sacrifice. They encouraged those supportive of their cause to wear yellow ribbons. And they marched through the streets of Hong Kong, bearing enormous swathes of black cloth, a sign of mourning and sorrow. The young activists at Scholarism were busy too. The Hong Kong Federation of Students had called a week-long strike starting on the 22nd of September. Wong and his fellow activists were working hard to get high school students to join. Um, I think the most difficult part in organizing a boy board of classes among secondary school students is that many secondary school students will face a lot of pressure um, in their school or maybe in the uh, family because they are still uh, not um, 18 years old yet. But we will still try our best because we hope that more uh, students can realize that their participation in social movements is really important in changing our political system in the future Hong Kong. September the 22nd, some 13,000 students gathered under a blazing sun at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. It was the start of the strike, and for Chow, the beginning of something bigger. <laughs> The next day, the students moved to Tamar Park, outside government headquarters. They had planned their strike carefully, organizing outdoor lectures and political debates throughout the week. 
but the student leaders said what they really wanted was a meeting with Chief Executive C. Y. Lung. As a reminder, they tied yellow ribbons on the fence outside Lung's office. The chief executive didn't respond. Meanwhile, volunteers at Occupy Central were preparing for their big protest. They were cautious, even going so far as to confiscate phones when the discussion got sensitive. Though the date had yet to be announced, the occupation was widely expected to take place on October the 1st, China's National Day. Because of the risks involved, they weren't expecting more than a few thousand people to turn up. The second last night of the strike, and the students were out on a march. They were headed for Government House, home to CY Learn. They vowed to stay until the chief executive left for work the next morning. A small group of students managed to get to the front gate the next morning. But again, they received no response. September the 26th, Scholarism and a group of some 2,000 secondary school students joined the final day of the boycott. It was late in the evening when Joshua Wong sprang a surprise. The response was instantaneous. Civic Square was a popular protest spot that had recently been fenced off by the government. By storming it, the students were also drawing attention to what they saw as the government's increasingly unreasonable behavior. Police quickly closed off the square and Wong was swiftly arrested. Outside the square, supporters started forming human walls in an attempt to stop more police from accessing the area. Across the road, a line of police tried to come through. Protesters surged forward, arms raised. It was then that someone opened an umbrella to defend himself in case the police used pepper spray. Others did the same. Similar scenes would occur in the days that followed. The umbrella soon became the symbol of the protest. At seven in the morning, police used pepper spray on a group of protesters. But it was clear even at this early stage that the students weren't backing down. As police secured one area, they quickly set up new blockades and new lines of defense. On the evening of the 27th of September, Occupy Central declared the start of their civil disobedience action. 
But even though the decision was supported by the student leaders, it didn't go down well with everyone. September the 28th. Although some protesters did leave the night before, many more were starting to arrive. News that police were restricting access to the protest site had caused outrage. Some people decided that they would block the roads surrounding the area instead. By late afternoon, the word had spread. Thousands of protesters had taken over some of downtown Hong Kong's most important roads. Police won't let them get in, right? No. Yes, that's why they occupy. If they let people use this space, this thing will not happen. So it is only because of our government. It's so coercive that have this result. Hey, guys, you come. Don't The umbrellas were up. Police had started putting on gas masks. And then a surprising change of mind. But over on the main road facing the government complex, chaos as police fired tear gas on protesters. These were just the first of 87 rounds. But rather than drive people away, the tear gas had the opposite effect. as many as 200,000 protesters filled the streets of downtown Hong Kong, angered by what the police had done. Similar occupations also sprung up in other areas. October the 1st, five days after the storming of Civic Square, the student leaders who had triggered Hong Kong's biggest protests addressed the crowd. They were celebrated as heroes that night even as authorities prepared a tougher response. No one knew then just how difficult things would become. Oh, no!